Welcome to Cartronomics with Arjun. The show aims to unravel the layers of the fintech sector and the rapidly evolving tech startup ecosystem across the MENA region and beyond. I am your host, Arjun, and I will be inviting founders, executives, investors, regulators, and other influential stakeholders to discuss and dissect the highs and lows of their own ventures and how they foresee the wider ecosystem evolve. Join us as we celebrate success and the spirit of risk-taking the candid discussion that goes past a timid question and cautious answers. This show is produced in collaboration with Adyan, a reliable end-to-end payment solution that enables businesses to turn payments into a strategic growth driver. We're also brought to you by Lulu Financial Group, a global financial services provider headquartered in Abu Dhabi and operating in 11 countries. Finally, Couchonomics with Arjun Singh, is brought to you by M2P Fintech, Asia's leading payment infrastructure company that enables businesses of any scale to embed financial products. Good day. Welcome to today's episode of Couchonomics with Arjun Singh. I'm your host, Arjun, and today I'm joined by Philippe Debaka. Philippe currently is the global head of financial services with Arthur D. Little, also better known as ADL. And before joining Arthur D. Little, some keywords come to mind. Some of those are Bain, SPACs, digital banks, transformation. So with that, I wanted to say hello to Philippe. Philippe, welcome to the show. Very nice uh, to be here. Thanks for having me. And I you. hope the couch is comfortable. It, it can do. It can do. It, it can do. All right. So Philippe, the purpose of today's, I guess, discussion is going to be this book that you have recently published. It's called Disruption. Uh, the future of banking and financial services, right? I, I think the obvious question to start with is, what was the motivation behind this fifth book that you have written? What we tried to do is is basically create a dialogue between between practitioners and people interested in banking. At very interesting times, uh, discontinuities, disruption, and really trying to understand uh, what will shape the future of the industry. And rather than come out and, and uh, have a prescriptive book, uh, we don't claim to have the answer, but we hopefully try to have a dialogue uh, between the readers, the practitioners, and cause people to pause and think what is the right model uh, for them and in what way the drivers of change will impact their own business model. Interesting. I'll, 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 I'll pick on your drivers of change, right? And, and uh, you've obviously written quite extensively about you know, the emergence of fintech, and the impact it's having on the, on the on the sector, and you know, also what the banks are trying to do. But here's sort of sort of my hypothesis, and maybe I've got this entirely wrong, right? So, so the way I see it is, you know, till about a decade ago, maybe a bit longer, the banks were actually having a great time, right? And and then we started to see the emergence of fintechs, which then got accelerated because uh, uh, more and more of them started to come into existence. They all got funded, and and. Uh, my view is they actually exposed the consumer, whether it was the end consumer or the business consumer, to a way of doing banking or financial services which was more pleasant, right? Uh, and in effect, actually, it shifted the needle in terms of what the customer expectation was, right? And now it's forcing the banks to adopt those practices, right? And, and actually, the banks are now competing with each other to behave more like the fintechs. I don't know. What, what's your take on that? We'll see banks compete against banks um, uh, for a share of the, of the new model. But we also see fintech trying to act like banks and, and uh, moving towards a, uh, regulatory um, supervision. What's interesting uh, equally is uh, we talk about the consumer. Uh, we can also talk about the SMEs that are equally uh, disrupted. Ultimately, it's not just about customer experience and a better way of doing banking. Uh, you have to take into account the competitive nature of the industry, which is the cost of acquisition uh, was uh, skyrocket. Uh, the, the cost of serving was completely out of line. And new business models have basically found a way of making the cost structure more variable while enhancing the customer experience. So it is not just about customer experience that's being challenged, but also the, the very structure of the business model 
uh, and um, and the way banks earn their 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 fees. Their fees. So 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 let's let's talk about structure, right? Uh, uh, so I I don't have the latest number, but I think we've got about three hundred digital neo banks in the world, right? Uh, maybe it's two fifty, maybe it's three hundred twenty five, but there's quite a lot of them, right? Uh, it's also quite widely written that the vast majority of them are in in a loss, right? They haven't made any money. Uh, the ones who have, um, uh, I think you can categorize them into two or three categories. Uh, the first category, which is the most common, is that they are obviously attached to a particular ecosystem. Uh, you could look at Kakao Bank uh, as one example. There are a couple of Chinese examples. The second is uh, are, the, are the ones who have had sort of time for maturation. You think of as one of them started in 2006. Now it's 2022. It's actually matured. It's making money. And then there are a few who, who specialize in particular niches and, and were always key clear that they wanted to make a bottom line profit very early. And Oak North comes to mind. What happens to the other 280? You know, is this just a question of time that we haven't given these banks enough time to break even and start making money? Or are this are some of these banks just endless pits where people are just going to keep throwing money into them? What we're seeing is, in fact, a, a good example of legacy banks fighting back. The over time, the performance gap between legacy banks uh, and um, uh, digital banks um, they've been closing the gap, and therefore it is increasingly difficult uh, for uh, neo banks to basically. Uh, put forward a differentiated value proposition that would actually move a fairly sticky uh, customer base. Secondly, 10 years on at, at least, uh, we are in a maturing phase of, of, uh, of the digital banking and neobanks. Uh, it's old news uh, and we see clearly winners emerging and, and, and losers. So we'll see a shakeout the way in fintech we will see um, a bloodbath in, in many sectors, you know, starting with payments. Um, very crowded market, uh, and we see the concentration and emerging winners um, on their way. So uh, digital banks that have not, at this point in time, made the cut, um, I think will, will fade away. Uh, secondly, we need to distinguish between the legacy banks that have set up their own uh, uh, neobanks and digital model and the pure native uh, that basically try to disrupt and what we see is a convergence of their model mm -hmm. uh, towards a more integrated, regulated. We think of uh, Revolut having asked uh, uh, for a, a license, and 26 uh, did exactly the same thing. So it's a normal evolution in their in their business model that that creates this convergence, which is one of the themes we we are uh, touching upon on the book. Yeah, we are. And and so so your suggestion is stick by these guys; they will turn the corner, or the vast majority will the vast majority will go by the wayside. Right. So a few of them will. Only few winners uh, right. will make it. So, so a few years ago, not a few years ago, I, I'll go as far as only six to nine months ago, right? There was a lot of conversation and we did see some evidence. And I think L Lending Club was a great example of, I think they bought Radius Bank, right? And Correct. if I'm not wrong, it's it's referred somewhere on the yes. page, if I remember it correctly. I have read the book, as you can see, right? Uh, a lot of that was basically courtesy high valuations, mm -hmm. right? Because a, a lot of these uh, 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 digital banks or fintech banks or whatever you want to call them actually had high valuation. We're seeing a period of massive correction in terms of that valuation, right? Correct. Both in the public markets where a number of these banks, whether they, they've gone public through SPACs or otherwise, are, are suffering quite miserably on their stock prices. In the private side also, it's becoming incredibly ha harder for them to continue raising money at exponentially higher valuations, right? Do you think that that trend of fintechs acquiring banks has got any future or is it going to be a one-way street, which is banks will buy the fintechs, including some of the digital banks, those who have realized that they don't have the ability to build digital right. attackers themselves. Two parts of your question. The first one is um, valuation, which have powered um, the emergence of uh, this new model. Basically, that model is flawed, and the market is catching up on it. Um, the expectation of exponential growth in terms of customers and the inability to actually convert customers into um, sufficient uh, fees and income um, has run its course. Mm -hmm. uh, so the market was due for correction, 
as soon as economic growth, um, political uncertainty, whatever uh, disruption um, is currently uh, impacting the market, uh, we see immediately uh, the correction and, and uh, indeed. So uh, that shows and exhibits uh, the, uh, the market participants that have a weak business model mm -hmm. and is not sustainable. So that's the first part. The second part, I think there are um, fintechs that play both on the customer front but also uh, as enablers. And I think yep. it's important to talk about th the role that fintechs have played uh, with uh, legacy banks and they really serve a purpose and, and these will actually will continue to thrive uh, and it opens the, the door to the banking as a service model as we know, et cetera. And lastly, you have some fintechs that managed to, uh, to build extraordinary global positions. Mm -hmm. If I take payments with, uh, 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 with Stripe, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, Stripe, yeah. it, it's, it's um, uh, really a very good example. So uh, in the end, will the, the laggers be bought for technology? Uh, will there be a competitive advantage to convert um, uh, customers that are not really active in a fintech? I doubt it. Technology costs have been dramatically uh, reducing, etc. The ability to customize um, uh, new tech is is uh, present. The challenge for legacy banks is their existing IT legacy structure. That is the the the, uh, the real issue. So the 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 challenge rests more on legacy banks, you know, to integrate new technology rather than fintech being able to provide a. Uh, a service to them. So that's very interesting. So if I take that on, so Jamie Dimon was, you know, very public with his recent announcement in terms of the multi-billion dollars spent on IT and, 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 and so much so that he actually, uh, I think took a hit on the, on, on, on its stock price for, for, a, for a period of time. Uh, uh, and this was before we actually started seeing the correction. So is what JP Morgan doing the correct thing, which is, seriously inflating their technology budgets and saying that we have to now start investing in technology ourselves or do more what some of the other banks are doing. And actually, JP Morgan has been a case in point, which is start to acquire a number of fintechs in large numbers in particular categories to basically take that leapfrog jump because a lot of that enablement is technology. I do appreciate it. It's it's fast commoditizing and the price is actually dropping. But it's not just about, uh, I guess, uh, uh, being able to uh, build technology themselves. Some of these fintechs come with more than technology which you can rebuild. So question again, I'm sorry, it's a long-winded question. Do you think the strategy that JP Morgan Chase has chosen to adopt is the one that most banks should look at adopting? He started off with a very provocative statement saying that, you know, banks are no longer, you know, financial service institution, but technology um, uh, firms. And, and I think that was a, a way of, of preparing the market, uh, capital markets, you know, for a, a change in, in strategy. Uh, is the world largest bank um, extremely successful in its strategy, uh, very focused, um, and, and therefore they can afford to do things at a scale that other banks cannot? cannot. So it's usual make or buy decision. Uh, ultimately, banks will uh, have a portfolio of initiatives, internal development, but also, uh, you're quite right, uh, seizing opportunities in the, in the marketplace because it's not just technology, but the interesting business model and also the capabilities that, that you are you're acquiring. One of the biggest challenges that uh, legacy banks have, but fintechs alike, is to have in sufficient numbers the right talent to come True. Uh, and, and work with them. So it's also a way of making sure that uh, you have a model that can be part of a financial institutions without really integrating um, the the bank itself, uh, which might you know completely suffocate and 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 put the uh, the creativity in a straight jacket. So I believe that the successful uh, path will be some form of of uh, hybrid between own development, which is necessary, um, but also opportunities in the marketplace for the host of reasons we alluded to. To acquiring, right. And you, you mentioned the word business model. So I think that's interesting, right? So um, I, 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 uh, it's a saying that has gone around for the last five years. The world's largest taxi company doesn't own taxis, but God bless Uber, I don't think they've yet to make money. Uh, the, 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 the world's largest, I guess, uh, uh, hotel room provider doesn't own any of its rooms, Airbnb. Uh, and, and, and I think there are several other examples in terms of the largest... Well, I can't say the largest streaming uh, 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 
or, or streaming or movie provider doesn't own cinema halls, i.e. Netflix. So what is the future for the banking model? Uh, how are, th- are they going to continue making money the same way they've done in the past? Um, is it going to evolve? Is it going to evolve a lot further away from how they've made money in the past and the future? There's a, a lot of experimentation right now. Uh, and uh, we see banks uh, trying to challenge you know, legacy uh, business models. Um, uh, some of them are successful, some are not successful. But ultimately, with such un- uncertainty and discontinuity, it is imperative from a strategic perspective to take a stake in the ground and uh, for the bank to have a view on what that point of arrival uh, might be. And there might be as many opinions as, as there are practitioners. Uh, this being said, there is a common theme, which is that the universal banking model has run its course. Okay. And, and therefore, we begin to see that uh, trying to be um, all things to all people in all geographies is from a return capability uh, and regulatory compliance perspective uh, impossible. We witness, therefore, the uh, money centers, the large regional banks, uh, be European, American, or Asian, pulling out of some markets. We see divestments of certain business lines uh, simply because uh, 101 of strategy is uh, uh, focus, get to scale, and um, spring your resources across um, different business lines where you don't have uh, the, the relative market share, scale, and capabilities will give you infi- inferior returns. And this is why so many banks are trading below a uh, net tangible book. So ultimately, banks have no choice like fintechs as well, to have a view for themselves of what the, the future point of arrival would be for the industry. And that's very interesting. So just to prove to you, I have read this book, uh, thanks to Juan, who's one of your co-authors when I was in Spain with him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you talk about a point, you talk about the point of arrival, right? Um, uh, there's two parts to this question. One is, how does any institution right in 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 especially in an environment where there is so much flux and change actually even arrive at a conclusion of what the point of arrival is let me ask you the second part of the question can you can you possibly use this region as an example in terms of what's the advice out here and i know this is about asking uh, probing a, a dialogue so i'm putting you on the spot apologies for that so for the banks in this region, right, who have actually enjoyed a, a great run and they continue to uh, announce bumper profits uh, even now, how real is that statement of knowing where your point of arrival is to the Middle East and, and, and sort of North Africa region? And how do they arrive at that answer? Each market has its own dynamics, and I, and I think it's very dangerous to compare markets and, and come to a very broad statement about uh, industry trends. Uh, this being said, uh, the, the economic fundamental economics law um, remain. Um, and today we have seen, for instance, a number of smaller banks, uh, particularly in the Islamic banks, uh, needing scale. Um, and we, we have seen uh, the desire to create champions because indeed some businesses um, are, are scale-driven and relative market share drives returns as well. So this consolidation trend is very much uh, uh, happening. Secondly, we see experimentation. Uh, new business models, we see uh, the emergence of, uh, of many fintechs, we see uh, fintech hubs uh, really powering this, this change. Private equity is, is moving as well, which are all ingredients which, in my opinion, will help uh, facilitate but also accelerate um, the um, the test and learn that banks will do uh, to find their right model. They, however, face, like every other bank, the challenge of transforming their legacy to the, to the new model. Uh, I believe that it will be ultimately a hybrid uh, model um, and where fintech will have the, their place, uh, but banks will continue to, um, in this market, own the customer uh, for regulatory purposes, but also because the stickiness of, uh, of the c- of customer franchise, perhaps more than I- in other parts of, uh, uh, of the world. So uh, I, I believe that the market will remain um, attractive. Um, we need to be vigilant uh, with what will happen in sort of economic 
uh, environment. Uh, inflation is on the rise, which could be a, a very good news for, for banks with an uh, expected increase in interest rates, um, which w I think will give the right, uh, the right transformation margin for them to continue their transformation. We need to look at it also the, in uh, the medium term. This is not a one-off. This is not a 12 months. Uh, the best transformation examples in different geographies, including Commonwealth Bank in Australia, this is a 10-year journey. And I think if we take a snapshot of 18 months, uh, I think we have completed the wrong picture uh, as to um, what is realistic to expect from, from uh, local banks, uh, be it here or anywhere. So, 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 so my take on that is point of arrival is... There are several points of arrivals in the future. You've got to put your stake on the ground somewhere, uh, which is within a horizon that is digestible. The journey is a lot longer than where the absolutely, and, and it depends on on the bank's individual starting point. Yeah, and I do, and I do agree with you. I think in this part of the world, and again, this is my personal opinion. So please, you know, feel free to correct me. I think one more angle here is that that there is a the, the, the trust factor. I think the fintechs have to go through a much more, I think the maturation cycle is uh, is required for the fintechs to get to that trust level uh, where, you know, consumers are happy to deploy, you know, large sums of capital with fintechs, irrespective of even if they get and the licenses. And banks have to earn the trust back when it comes to advice. Advice. I totally agree with you. Let, let's, let's switch to the, to, to a topic that, that you and I uh, discuss quite often, right? Um, uh, coming back to the customer, right? So, so, so a key point in your, in your uh, book, and it comes back to is, are you looking at your business model? Are you looking at your business from a consumer's point of view, yeah. right? And, and uh, to oversimplify that question, there's two, in, two, two parts to that. One is actually the consumer experience. So are you able to give them the experience that they so desire or they're so getting used to now because of fintechs and otherwise. The other is how are you actually attracting them? So, you know, the whole concept of marketing, right? Marketing, unfortunately, has been, for most banks in this part of the f world, a laggard function, right? It's sort of at best an afterthought. Uh, I don't want to be rude, but it, it, it is a, a, a billboard on Sheikh Zayed Road um, or, uh, you know, <laughs> these days an ad on Instagram. Um, I want you to play back the, the, the debates we have on digital marketing, right? And what that really actually means. I think it's fascinating and it's nothing new under the sun. If you go back uh, with the emergence of the CRM, um, banks have put really expensive, advanced uh, infrastructure, and yet they failed to capitalize on its, on its benefit simply because they didn't have either the data or the ability to use it and they stayed uh, basically dormant. So the hope of a 360 view of the customer at the time uh, never happened. It, it seems fairly similar today. We're putting the digital infrastructure into place. We're contact, you know, we're in touch with the, with the customers in, in, a, in a virtual manner. Uh, but yet, uh, the only way most players look at digital, you're quite right, is social media. Mm -hmm. And they get to the point where they even will pay uh, to um, uh, to get uh, customers and, and and advertise, so the customer acquisition will in fact not be vastly different from the legacy branch, um, you know, network. So the question is, how can banks learn to really use uh, the um, uh, the digital infrastructure that they have? And digital marketing is 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 very nascent. And I believe that uh, if if you look at the economic cost and the opportunity in terms of revenue enhancement, it's an area where banks would be well advised to uh, uh, to d double down on. No, I agree with you. I think there are some excellent examples in the coming out of China in terms of how insurance companies have actually taken to TikTok, but not just putting an ad out there, but generally genuinely driving social commerce. Uh, and I think you know there are certain uh, insurance companies which have sold millions of policies now on the back of TikTok, right? And who would have imagined that, right? Um, we, need, we need to remove our blinders. We need, we need to be open to uh, unique, different, non-traditional combinations, both in terms of channels, partnerships, and the way we engage with, with the customer. Uh, we need to be m more innovative. We need to be more uh, daring. Um, and we need to experiment. But certainly, putting traditional marketing on digital channels is doomed to fail. So, so that brings me to an, uh, a question I, I, uh, uh, on conversions. Telco banking partnerships, right? Um, 
It's a 20-year-old story, if not a 30-year-old story, right? It's uh, Telcos have always threatened to get into the banking space. Banks have always tried to partner, right? The vast majority of them have not succeeded. I think I think if, I, if you take Ac- Africa as an exception, let's put that aside. I think completely different reasons. Do you see the future between telco banking partnerships to be a lot more rosier than the past? I think different partners are learning how they can um, derive mutual benefit in a different way. Historically, um, financial institutions simply wanted to be uh, on the home screen uh, of, a, of a telco uh, mm-hmm. customer um, and for which they would uh, derive a commission, mm-hmm. like a distribution commission. That evolve, is evolving quite dramatically into an ecosystem. And we see uh, the clash of super apps where different players are coming from different angles yep. and everybody is trying to cannibalize um, on, on each other's uh, business. Uh, we need to be indeed very vigilant to see where people make their money and, and how uh, money will be made. But owning the customers, owning the franchise, being able to interact uh, with, with customers and engaging with them, which will increase the number of touch points, drives revenue. And therefore, it is a, the potential win-win, not just by uh, giving access, but really by creating the right engagement and the right ecosystem through different types of partnerships. It's not one and the other, but it has to be an ecosystem. Yeah, and I totally agree. And I think the, my, my word for that is co-orchestration. Right? If both of them can actually come as co-orchestrators, I do think there is an opportunity. If Absolutely. it is the master service, a master-servant relationship, unfortunately, either way, it doesn't it work. Dormant. Right. La- last question, and, and coming back to the human side of all of this. right? So, so there is a challenge across the board in terms of talent. What do the future boards look like for these banks? Right. What do the future executive committees look like, these banks? Right. Because decision-making is, is driven talent actually drives the execution. How big a challenge do you see that today within the banks? And uh, We could take this region for context or, 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 or the global market, whichever one you prefer. And, and again, uh, what's the hard question out here that, that, that banks need to ask themselves? In a transformation, it's a multi-year um, exercise, painful, difficult. You have many stakeholders to contend with and therefore the ability to sustain the effort over time requires an alignment between the board and the executive suite. Without that alignment, it is very difficult to align incentives, um, have um, a a, a right message with capital markets, um, shareholders, and having the right measure of success over an extended period of time. So this notion of alignment is important, but it's also equally important uh, within the business lines to make sure that uh, implementation goes through. So there's a capability uh, issue in, in, in banks. We've talked about you know, the dire need for, uh, for talent that are all fleeing to the uh, uh, Google-like. Uh, but equally, there is the governance that needs to drive this transformation. Totally. And this governance is equally important as capabilities. Philippe, I think we're out of time. I think I've taken more time than I should have of you. Thank you for coming. Right. Great to be here. Right. And uh, I wanted to thank everybody who's uh, streamed in to listen to the podcast. Um, the book is called Disruption. Um, it's actually now available. Uh, what we will make sure is that we put the link at the bottom of our of our podcast and our, our, our posts on LinkedIn and other social channels where you can actually click and buy the book. Uh, I do think it's worth a read. Uh, I think the last chapter is actually the most interesting one where there is a series of questions which have been posed. With that, I'd like to say goodbye and thank you till I see you guys next next time. Bye-bye.